I don't find it that complicated. I don't, I've never found River Song's uh, timeline that complicated. It's just uh, she has the, the adventures roughly, broadly speaking, in reverse order to the Doctor. Scanning for audio. Hello and welcome to a Tin Dog Podcast. Yes, it's been a few days now since the wedding of River Song. Which is fine. My Libsyn account was full, so I couldn't really, well, you know, get a show out in time. But as it's become available on Friday, here we are. Ready to talk at reasonably great length about a reasonably good episode. But first, here's me, recorded last Wednesday, three days before the episode, with some hopes and fears about the story itself. Hello, me of the future. Well, I say me of the future, it's actually me. Probably Saturday or Sunday recording a proper Tin Dog podcast. But right now, as I speak, it's Wednesday. Yes, just as confusing as probably the episode of Doctor Who where you've just watched. See, I've not seen it yet. I just wanted to talk for a moment about my hopes, my thoughts, what I thought might happen on Saturday, and let's just see if I'm right or not. First off, prediction number one, the eye patches. I'm guessing that the purpose of them is to allow you to see and remember the silence. I'm thinking that this whole river story might not be as connected as I thought it would be to the silence in the library. I'm thinking that's an entire entity by itself, although we might end up looking at it slightly differently, hence the whole marriage of River Song, the name being given and things like that. Now, I've got some mental theories, I've got some good theories, but let's face it, they're just theories. Part of me still holding out for it not being River inside the costume. That's the spacesuit underneath the lake. That's the, the obvious solution, and I say obvious solution, it's a Moffat convoluted script. Oh, and I've just found out today that Doctor Who Confidential seems to have been cancelled. Now, I must admit, I've not paid as much attention to it since Smith turned up, which is an oversight of mine. I suppose, for me, it's actually closer to jealousy, looking at all these people making this TV programme, and I'm not one of them. But let's leave it there. The important bit for this is other theories, or questions that we need answered. Where has the Doctor been for his 200 years? That's important. It's the biggest big finish gap you can plug at any point, but I don't think it's going to be dealt with here, so what else? How did the Doctor, this is Doctor 950, the 950 year old Doctor, the one last seen at Christmas, how did he get his post? I suppose he got his post in exactly the same way that he gets his newspapers with Doctor written across the front, eventually. So we're assuming that Doctor 950 is the one who is in the cantina as seen in the impossible astronaut and doctor 1100 doctor 1100 let's call him a doctor 1100 doctor 1100 is the one wearing the stetson hat the one who posted things too late last week yes still haven't quite managed to let that one go yet so doctor 1100 will be the main focus of this story because that's where we're up to following the doctor's timeline so doctor 950 he was the one seen in that cut sequence at the beginning of Impossible Astronaut. Then he gets his letter, then he heads off to the cantina. Now, I still am holding out that he'll be the one inside the costume, but that would imply that he was made aware in his letter in order to do that. Now, my other theory is that River Song's timeline is a bit skewy. It has two parallel events going on. River could, in fact not to die in Silence of the Library if the Doctor dies, if you see what I mean. That storyline wouldn't take place, or indeed might take place, but differently, because the Doctor wouldn't be dead at that point because it's still David Tennant's Doctor. Doctor 900, shall we say. She can kill Doctor 1100 because, well, she needs to, but I think that Madame Cavornia could be the next regeneration of River Song. 
if that storyline hadn't gone on. But of course that wouldn't be the case because River's already given the rest of her remaining regenerations to the Doctor by this point in the timeline. So that theory's out the window, which is a shame because I was thinking old River Song, Madame Cavonia, was the one controlling his, but she couldn't be because of that. You see, we can come up with reasons why of all our theories are mental and couldn't work. But really it comes down to Mr Moffat and what he's going to present us with. Do you remember a time when you could watch Doctor Who without needing flow charts and pointy bits of sticky tape and little memo blocks? Ah, those days are gone. They may return next year. But either way, by the time you hear this, you'll already know the answer to all these questions. I now return you to myself in the future. So yes, I still don't think we, well, I don't think we'll ever know what made the TARDIS explode and what's the nature stroke, all the nonsense of the silence. Yes, and of course, according to the internet movie database, it's not Federick at all. Mark Gatiss' character has a completely different name. So that's fine, at least I know all that. Now, it's time to look at my two pages of notes that I've made over the last few days and get back to you. First off, I need to say that my first reaction to watching the episode was one of oh can I have my show back please I felt like that a lot over the years and I felt like that under well everyone who's run it but this week I actually felt myself going you know I miss Tennant I miss Russell that's not good is it I mean we're labouring under the world of the moth but Russell did paint the moth into a massive corner when it came to the Time Lord God so perhaps Spending a year keeping your head down will be fine. So let's look at what we know at this point. We know that there's a Christmas special. We know, thanks to one or two released photographs, that a certain ponds may appear, which is fine. We know that next year, the chances are it's going to start in August and go all the way through to Christmas and then beyond, thus taking us in 2013 all the way through the anniversary special which will then be the point where Smith's been in the role for four years, which, not counting some specials, which was the same length of time that Tennant did the job. Officially, he's in the role for, you know, five years, but four years in the job and four special guest appearances, does that count as five years? I suppose it does on paper. So he ends up doing the same length of time as Tennant, because at the fall of the 11th, which, if you want to take it as anything other than when Smith decides to leave, is fine. So yeah, he'll probably do the same length of time as Tennant, because let's hope it's he's signed up for the 50th anniversary, because you'd be a fool not to. And then you can go. So the fall of the 11th is penciled in for 2013. And of course, the whole of the Doctor Who franchise is now summed up in one joke. Knock, knock. Who's there? Yes, he is. And eventually you'll find out who the Doctor really is. And the answer, as well as the question, was hidden in plain sight. A madman with a box. And nothing more. Someone who got bored and left Gallifrey. Yes, Russell on Omega and the other for us old school fans. But is it really that important? Okay, he was there and managed to kickstart the entire universe. Twice. That's fine. And surely that makes him a god in some people's books. Good wizards, that kind of thing. So unless Moffat's got something miraculous planned, it's just going to be a bit... I don't know. But I'm not here to talk about the future, the distant future, or anybody's intentions, or what me, some bloke who doesn't know better, is just going to surmise and guess at. Some people out there email me with questions, questions about the production, about what's happening. I know as much as you, which is nothing. I haven't got connections, I haven't got insider information. What I've got is opinions, and every Doctor Who fan in the world's got those. There's a line in the film, Le Jeté, and I say a film, it's 22 minutes long, which translates from the French as, Memories are the scars made by time. And it's not up to us which scars become memories. And I think that's kind of how you can look at this whole series. In a couple of years' time, you might look back and go... Do you know which episode I'll watch when I'm bored? The one that triggers memories, makes you think. Could be Curse of the Black Spot. For all you know, it could be. It might, even for me, the cynic who wasn't infected by it at all. The girl who waited. 
right now, I don't really fancy watching it again. But it might come back to me. It might change my mind. Now, I don't know what other people thought of this particular episode. It does kind of bring to a close the whole River Song story arc. Any stories that are missing that were covered in the diary took place in the missing 200 years. And for anyone interested in knowing about the whole river thing in order, I'm sure you can track down the 15-minute segment that was used on Confidential. And if anyone really needs to hear it, I'm sure I can put it on here as an Easter egg at some point in the future. Email me if you really want that. Because I know that Confidential doesn't get to every country. And Confidential cutdowns, well, that's all we've got. And from now, we won't have Confidentials ever again. Because it does look like the BBC are cutting it. Now I know there are many opinions about Confidential. But at the minute, there are, I believe, tens of thousands of signatures on a petition saying, please save Confidential. There are Facebook pages. There are Twitter accounts. There seems to be a rise building. And it's nice to know that it's still the same sort of drive that we used to get in the 80s when they were talking about cancelling, well, the main show not just a show about a show. But I'm not here to talk about that either. Again, I'm back to talk about The Wedding of River Song. And as I said when I watched it, I just went, "Uh, well, it was all right. There wasn't anyone. There wasn't a switcheroo in the costume. It wasn't like when the Pandorica opened and it was Amy sitting there and you went, oh. Because I suppose if that had happened, we would have just gone, yeah, we've seen this trick before, you're showing it again. We still wouldn't have been happy. We're very very easy to annoy. So perhaps they double bluffed us into thinking that River Song wouldn't be in the suit by showing us her in the suit and then she was in the suit. Now, I know a lot of people out there, I suspect a lot of people out there, let us correct that, will have watched the opening sequence and gone, this is cool and it did look brill. All time happening at once, but that's all weather happening at once, or everything that's ever lived happening at once, or is it just more like one of those montages you get on X Factor. Here's your best bit. That's why we've got Churchill being Caesar. We've got some Silurians. Yes, I know it's old school fans will want something. A cough and a spit from somebody who's from the old series. Hey, how excited did people get when the Dravins were in orbit above Stonehenge? So yeah, it looked nice. The steampunk fan in me, yes, have a drink on the game, that's not important. The steampunk fan in me liked it, was impressed, but kind of went... Because this whole episode happens in a fraction of a second in a parallel universe somewhere else. With a lot of exposition. I don't like the silence. I don't like their silly big hands. I don't like their heads. I don't like the way everyone forgets them. Oh, quick question. In The Impossible Astronaut, River Song is talking to Rory, and she moves the gun behind her to shoot a silent. How does she know it's there? She's not looking at him. Sorry, that was just something that occurred to me while I was watching some clips. So is this program, is this whole River Song storyline, or this time track thing, like an inverse magic eye? The more you look at it, the less sense it makes. Yes, I've got little problems with it, like girlfriend marriage services being too short, or little things like that. And yes, we were bluffed. We were bluffed. And we've been tricked. Rule one, remember, the doctor lies, and he lies to Canton. Canton's the one who says, no, that really is the doctor's body, and everyone believes that. And because he's telling us that, we believe him, and we sure that that's what he's been told. So the guy will turn up again at some point, I'm very sure about that. So the whole thing, in the end, is sorted out, yes, by the numbskulls. And you kind of knew something was up during the opening previously on, when they took time to explain what the Tesseract was. But then you were thinking, no, that's too obvious. The Flesh Doctor, too obvious. All of these things are too obvious, but it's a kid's show. Yes, be clever by all means, but you loaded the gun five episodes ago, and now you can fire it, so to speak. Getting back to the soothsayer bit from earlier, was it just me that I was expecting Rory to come out in chains? No, oh, perhaps not, I don't know. So yes, I'm looking forward to 2012, the year of keeping your head down, as it'll be known. Not that that'll work. Yes, like I said, I've got issues. I always will have. Heads in a box. I don't like that. It's just a bit too Futurama-y for my liking. 
I was never particularly fond of Dorian as a character to begin with, so that's fine. The carnivorous skulls makes so little sense, but the headless monks make no sense at all anyway. They just don't. I don't get it. I don't understand. It just doesn't work. Isn't there a line in a song that says he died while faking his own death? Or have I just dreamed that? It's probably a Carter reference. I don't know. They're the sort of clever lyrics that they used to do, wasn't it? I did have a huge monologue prepared, and I've got lots of notes written down that basically compare the lakeside to the Garden of Gethsemane, and is River Song Judas Iscariot because she's the one who betrays the Doctor but doesn't mean to, but it's destiny in order to save the universe because the universe is the only beloved son, and so on. And then you get regeneration and resurrection and things because the guy doesn't actually die. But he sacrifices himself and doesn't want to go. Can you see where I'm going with this? But the whole Time Lord slash Christian mythology thing has been flogged to death. We don't need to go down that road. It's not important. In many senses, it could be more argued that this is actually pro-assisted suicide storyline. But that's just reading far too much into something that isn't there, and is the sort of thing media students could blab on about for months. So yes, it was good. It was good. I've watched it twice since, but I don't know if I've watched it twice since in order to convince myself it was better than it was. You can't keep blowing up the universe and fixing it, but I guess, in a sense, he did. This sort of thing never used to happen in the old days. Stories were smaller, and God, I hope that's what we get next year. I really do. So yes, I'll fade away and try and cram this onto my feed and then talk about some lovely Sarah Jane Smith very, very soon. Because the mammoth run of Doctor Who, then Torchwood, then Doctor Who, then Sarah Jane Smith is all over in two weeks. And then all the podcasters in all the world will go off and start reviewing their own little things once more. And you won't have to listen to exactly the same shows from exactly the same people time and time again. Because we've all got our own opinions about our own little things. So let's hope there's no more silence for a while. And that the old Daleks come back. And that I speak to you all very, very soon about more Doctor Who. Be seeing you. You have been listening to the Tin Dog Podcast. Doctor Who and its associated shows are all trademark of the BBC. No infringement is intended. Contact us at tin-dog at hotmail.co.uk.